Thank you for allowing us as we start on our way. We thank you, O Lord, for all that you have done, O Lord. We thank you, O Lord, for just being and having a mind to want to come to the house of the Lord. Lord God, we come to say thank you, O Lord. Hallelujah. For you are worthy to be praised. We thank you, O Lord, for another day, O Lord, another opportunity, O Lord, to come and praise your mighty name. For you are such a worthy God, you are an awesome God, and we thank you for all that you have done and what you continue to do. Lord God, we ask, O oh Lord, as our Sunday school with us goes forth this morning, give us ears to hear and our hearts to receive your word, O oh Lord. We ask that we open that you open our understanding to what thus says, O oh Lord. Lord God, I ask we ask and we have to we get the word, we ask you to help us to apply the word of God to our life, O oh Lord. Lord God, we just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for giving us strength to get here. Thank you, O oh Lord. Lord God, we actually look over the ones that are able to make it, O oh Lord, to be here. Continue to strengthen their bodies. Continue to heal and deliver, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we forever give you the honor and glory to your mighty name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Switch from Proverbs 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to receive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give summary to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall retain unto wise counsels, to understand the proverb and the interpretations. The words of the wise and their dark sins. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fool despises wisdom and instruction. May the Lord help us to read in His words. We are reading Proverbs 1, first chapter, verses 1 through 7. And I'll turn to the hands of Lady Pete for our Sunday school lesson at this time. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I'd like to say good morning and praise the Lord. <laughs> God is a good God. He's good. And in all things, we give him thanks and we give him praise and we give him honor for being who he is. We give him honor for just being the one true holy God. And I am, uh, uh, you know, we, it, I'm glad about knowing who he is and knowing what his name is and knowing that he is Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm glad about that. You know, we sing a song 
that says everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know. And and so uh, uh, you 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 to understand that is to get out of the bubble and and talk to people, talk to different ones, and find out that everybody don't know. Everybody don't know. So we don't want to take it for granted. We, we tend to take it for granted because we're here among us and among the ones that 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 know. We talk among ourselves and people come around us. Oh, Jesus, we, we know who Jesus is. But there is a world out there that don't know who Jesus is. And that is our purpose and our assignment in the body of Christ is to spread our testimony and spread the love of God so people will know who Jesus is. Praise God, praise God. That song has a different meaning to me. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And I'm glad I know him. Praise God. And going into our lesson um, today, for such a time as this, and just bear with me a little bit. I'm sharing my screen with those that will be online. For such a time as this. And when we when we look at it in today, for today, your circumstances, your situation, you are in the place. Where you suppose if we're if we're following the footsteps of God, the ones that He have ordered for us, the people that come across your path, the things that happen, and you're able to speak a word at the right time, goes with this lesson for such a time as this. Because we always say our steps are ordered by the Lord, and if for this particular moment, I'm here for such a time as this, whatever is needed at this moment, and I'm able to provide it, that was <laughs> for such a time as this. And we're going to get a better understanding of that time. We think that we, we're moving through with no purpose. But there's purpose in our lives that you could have you could have said a word to somebody and that kept them from harm's way. You could have said one word to somebody and that kept them from depression or it kept them from committing suicide. You were at the right place at the right time for such a time as this. So for this, it says for such a time, for such a time. Um, it, the focus thought says God has called us to work in the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, we wasn't there back in, in, in the 2,000 years ago because that wasn't our time. That wasn't our time. Our time is now, and we're going to get a better understanding of that. Um, going to our focus verse, it's coming out of Esther 4, 14. It says, for thou... For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Maybe, maybe this is the reason that you're here. You understand what I'm saying? So this is the, this is the understanding that we want to get in this lesson. This may be the reason you're here for whatever you're doing right now, for whatever, you know, God is calling you to do. This is the time. Maybe this was the reason you may have had another thought process. You might have said, well, I'm going to this job because it pays more money. 
And then God allows you to be in a place where you're able to minister and do the work of the Lord a little bit more freely. You're able to touch lives a little bit more where your thought process is said, I'm here to make more money. I got a promotion. I'm here for this. I'm here for that. But then when you come along and you find out God's purpose in that, then you realize for such a time, I'm here because he knew you were coming across my path. He knew I, uh, uh, I was here because you were going to need me or this situation was going to call for whatever God has placed in me in order to handle it for such a time. And so we're going to go into our lesson text. Um, and it's coming out of Esther. And we see that this, this lesson is utilizing the book of Esther. And we're only going to deal with a portion of it. There's the, the book of Esther have a lot of segments and a lot of portions that we could be touching on. But we're going to focus on a certain portion of Esther in order to uh, bring the lesson home. Um, our lesson text says, out of Esther 2, 17, and the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor. And that, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a gift of God when he allows you to obtain grace and favor, because she was above all the women. The king loved her above all the women. Now remember, we're talking about for such a time, he could have loved another woman. And she still uh, uh, could have been married to him, but he could have loved somebody else more. Favor could have been granted to someone else. But for such a time, Esther was in the kingdom for this time. It said, uh, in his sight, more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And that's another portion of the lesson that talks about the, the, uh, the one she succeeded. Esther 4, 13 through 17 says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thou peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go into in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. That's the famous line from Esther. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Praise God. And the and lesson text is going to be broken down further into when we get into searching the scripture. On, the, on our culture connection, it was talking about the real reality. And it was talking about reality shows. And as we always said, uh, we, we let you know that our culture connection drives home the lesson. And so, and it brings it to our current state. Okay. Because we know the Bible is written in a whole nother culture in over 2000 years ago. But in, but so the lesson is letting us know the Bible is relevant for today. The lesson is still relevant for today. So we have a culture connection. 
Yeah. Okay. And a lot of times God will give us our own personal culture connections. Yeah. This is this 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 writer just gave us a name for it. Okay. Yeah. So in this one, it's talking about a reality show. And you know, if somebody put a camera on us, we can be living a reality show. Nah. Okay. It's supposed to be what's going on in your reality right now. Okay, but it says here, few are reality. Few are reality, because they they gonna they uh, 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 gonna edit and they're gonna do all of these things. It says here, although they are designed to show real behind the scenes life on center stage, few are reality. But the winning are real. Okay, some reward the winners with cash and cars, and, and we've seen them. We, we've seen them all. Okay, and so, but it still, it goes down further and it says, but the story of Esther reads somewhat like a reality show script. Okay, the harem, they had a whole harem of women competing for the king's affections. Okay, all these women. And so that's the part we're not going to deal with today, but just to know, bring it to your remembrance. She had instructions and then she had to be prepped and, and, and prepared for the king. So she went through a whole ritual in order to get to the verses that we're talking about now. Okay. And so that's why it says that it was like a reality show because she was competing for all these women. That's why the lesson text says she was highly a favorite above all, um, among all these other women because it was more than one. Okay. It said, but the winner did not just walk away with cash or car. The winner was given the privilege to marry the king himself. Okay. So it was, there was a, a lot at stake here. Okay. And so Hadasha whose whose name was later changed to Esther, entered the contest at the urging of her cousin, and she won. Okay? When the royals placed the crown on her head, she was elevated from being Mordecai's cute Jewish cousin to the queen of the entire nation of Persia, seemingly overnight. Okay, so this cultural connection is still giving you a little bit of background. Okay, it says here, the mention of God is notably absent in the entire book of Esther, but his providence and fingerprints are seen all throughout his 10 chapters. God protected Esther from her enemies, and because Esther believed God, God used her and saved her people from annihilation. The people through which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will be born. See, things are strategic. This Bible is strategic. God had people, here we go again, for such a time. Because you had to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. As Pastor was uh, teaching on Wednesday night about good intentions. It may be the right you have a good intention, but it may not be the right time. It may not be the right place. So the good intention didn't help you at that moment because everything has to line up. You know how people say all ducks got to be in a row. So here it was a setup because there was, there was still a plan and a purpose from the beginning that Jesus was coming on the scene to redeem his people. So therefore, everything that took place, every strategic move led to the birth of Jesus. Everything happened was leading. You know, so when you start tying everything together, it's leading. So here it said the people through which the Messiah Jesus Christ will be born. That, 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 that so, but that was far down the road. But what we're looking at is for such a time, for such a time, okay? Because had she not been in that place, then the then the, the her people, she couldn't have saved her people. The people would have been annihilated. And so that would have cut off some of the, 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 um, the seed from which the lineage was gonna become, was gonna be needed. And so going into contemplating the topic here, it says we're looking at our first, we're going to look at our outline, where we're going to uh, 
cover three three sections, and we're talking about Esther chooses, Haman's plot, and Esther stands. And and like I said, we are, we're somewhat familiar with the story, and so we're going to hit specific points in this particular lesson. It says, in the contemplating the topic, it said, life presents challenging choices to all of us, and that is the truth. I don't, if, if someone here that hasn't been presented with a challenge throughout your entire life, I think everybody here is over what? Over six months, right? Okay. Now, even at six months, guess what? There's a challenge. That baby still have a challenge. There's a challenge from the time you get here. There's challenges. And so, but now as we mature and we start growing older, we have challenging choices. A kid can have a challenging choice because if you see that cookie sitting on that table and mama said, don't take it or else, that's a challenging choice. Do I want the cookie bad enough to handle the or else? So life, as long as we're breathing and we're living, life is going to bring some challenges, okay? So the, the contemplating the topic, it, it, it goes and it's talking about this vessel, this Captain Cook, and he, he had a crash. He, his vessel crashed, and this was back in the 1770s, okay? And, uh, and what the contemplating the topic is trying to drive home is the choice. Okay, and it, it talks about it was he, it was almost an impossible choice. The the his vessel crashed and it got stuck. It 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 it, it went it ran into the jagged edges of a reef, and this was at eleven o'clock p.m. He sat there for twelve hours. Twelve hours had passed, and the ship was still stuck, not able to move. Now, here's the challenging choice. It was almost impossible. The choice is like, okay, if I do or if I don't, what's the outcome? The outcome looks almost the same. But he said if he had waited, he risked the loss of both ship and the crew if he just sat there and waited. Because don't sound like anybody was trying to come and find him. You just, 12 hours went by and you're still in the same place. Nothing is moving, nothing has changed. Abandoning the ship for the small lifeboats with the hopes of making it to shore was the next choice. But that meant he and his crew would be forced to remain in Australia for the rest of their lives. Now, either risk the loss of the ship and the crew or stay in Australia for the rest of your life. For me, the key word in that sentence was life. <laughs> the key word was life. You live in Australia, but you have a life. You stay with this ship. It's, 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 you, it's, it's, uh, no, it's like a no-brainer. You're going to lose life. Here is a Esther faced a similar decision that was filled with uncertainty and little chance of success, saying nothing meant she and her people were in peril and many would die. But speaking out could also mean death. So her choices were do nothing and they die. Speak out, possibly they will die but possibly they will live. So I have more of a 50-50 with the second choice. You, you see what I'm saying? So doing nothing, and that and that's, that's really, it, as you mature, you start realizing that if I do nothing, I'm guaranteed nothing. If I do nothing, I'm guaranteed failure. It is a guarantee. If I did, if, but if I try, I have a 50-50 chance of making it. But I take it away from 50-50 because when you try, you successful because you, you tried. You still made an effort and you still tried. And so, and, and even like education, people will, well, 
if I if I try, you know, I may not make it all the way through college, but guess what? Even the first year, you're going to learn something. So you're going to come out of it better than when you went in yeah. because you learned something through the first year. If it wasn't nothing but how to be independent, it wasn't if it wasn't nothing but I learned something about myself. If I can take, you know, things I can take or it changed my course, it changed my direction and said, OK, maybe I don't want to learn this. I want to study this because it opened up my eyes and introduced me to something. So so it really takes it away from the 50 50 because you win. You still win something. But doing nothing guarantees nothing. Doing nothing guarantees failure. So now here going in, we're going into searching the scriptures. These are the choices. Do nothing. So I guarantee that or try to do something. But we're going to see the journey to that in, in, um, in this lesson. It says here in searching the scriptures, uh, Esther chooses. The story of Esther, it captivates readers, okay? And it, and it gives a little bit of background here. Um, it talks about the reign and the king and, and, and the, um, the time frame in which uh, this was happening. And it said, Esther lived after the destruction of Judah and uh, Jerusalem in 586 BC, but before the return of Ezra and Nehemiah in 458 BC and 444 BC, respectively. And then it goes on to say, uh, it is likely that no biblical prophet was active within her time period. You know, and, and that, was, that was interesting. Um, God was still, you know, he God always has somebody in place that's going to hear him and follow and obey. There's always someone. He is not going to be left without a witness. This earth belonged to him. We belong to him. Creation belongs to him. Somebody is going to be there to follow God's plan. He's going to have somebody, even if it's just one. One is going to reach a thousand. God will never be left without. So even though it says here, in their in their research, it said that that time the prophet may not have been active, but guess what? Somebody was active in listening. There was an active listener somewhere around. Praise God! And anyone that that have dealt with uh, business seminars and, and different things like that, you you understand the active listener, and 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 and, and because everybody can say I'm listening and I'm listening and just miss a whole paragraph. But an active listener catches it. An active listener is participating in what's being said to them. So, so here it says the prophet Daniel was captive in Babylon. So it's given a time period. The prophet Daniel was captive in Babylon as it fell in Persia in 539 BC. But he died shortly after that event and was not present when the Esther story happened. Okay. It says, uh, it, it looks like Esther and the Jews who remained in Persia was alone. But then it goes down to say here, the decree of Cyrus in 538 BC stating that Jews could return to their homeland meant that many left captivity and returned to Judah, Judea. Now, remember, we had a lesson when King Cyrus came and, and, and they were, uh, um, and, and, and let them know that they can return, okay? Uh, but see, there's this, and so right here is looking like there's a portion, a portion that was the, that was here, okay? And so they were, they didn't have a prophet among them or anything. But it says here, Esther and many other Jews did not return, but remained in Persian city of Susa, and so that that uh, uh, that was the writer. The writer was was trying to convey but it says here in section a the king loved esther okay and it says 
just the writer is letting us know there's no specific reason given for the king to favor Esther. There was nothing written, but we know God uh, pl places favor on whom he wills. Okay? And it's for such a time. There, there wasn't a reason. There wasn't a rhyme and a reason because all the women were pretty. All the women were prepped. All the women were ready. But when the favor of God is on your life, there is no explanation. We can't explain favor, okay? We, we can't. We just ask God to, Lord, give me favor. Lord, let me, let me live in your favor and your graces because I'd rather have favor. Praise God, because favor opens doors that money can't. Favor opens doors that your words can't. Favor opens doors that your education can't. Praise God. So I'd rather live in favor. Praise God. So it says here that uh, um, it says, although her obedience to her cousin is highlighted as a commendable feature of her character, it is fair to suggest that her demeanor disposition were key factors. Okay? It says, no doubt Esther was physically beautiful, but other candidates for queen would also have been physically beautiful. So it's trying to show here that there was no extra, that, that she was looking better even though she was very beautiful, there were other beautiful women too. So favor just cannot be explained, okay? In the next paragraph, it gives the synopsis to that. It said God's hand was also at work in this situation. And we know that because of God's favor is why she was in that place for such a time, okay? It said Esther's selection by, king, by the king was part of God's plan. God could have saved his people any kind of way. And, and we all know that God was so powerful. He did such miraculous things. He could have just reached down and said, you're saved. You understand what I'm saying? You're saved. He could have did that. But he chose methods. He, he, he allows things to come. But it's God's method. It says here, we have been chosen to serve the king. Esther was chosen to serve an evil king in a foreign land. Okay? An evil king in a foreign land. Esther was chosen to do that. It says here, as citizens of heaven, we live in a foreign land, but we do not serve an evil king. We serve the righteous king. And it said we are foreign land. We're in a foreign land because we're a peculiar people. We're a royal priesthood. And, and this is not our home. You know, we hear that all the time. This is not our home. Praise God. He's gone to prepare a place for us. It says here, uh, uh, going down a little further, too many are guilty of thinking the church and even God exists for them. How many do you think, have you ran into people like that? You supposed to be a Christian. You, you supposed to be a Christian, so you should be saying yes to me whatever I ask. How dare you be a Christian and tell me no. But true joy, peace, and contentment are found when God's people embrace the truth that we are his servants. People do come in the house of God and treat God as though they're doing him a favor. Lord, I, I, at least I showed up and you should be happy that I showed up. You know, we treat people that way. People will treat other people that way. You know what I'm saying? You should be glad I'm still here. You should be glad that I even talk to you. My status, really, you should be glad that you are in my circle. So you should be showing me a little bit more gratitude. You should be showing me a little bit more gratitude. So Jesus, you should be blessing me a little more because I walk in the door. I sat on the pew. I showed up. So you, 
You should be glad, God. And I put on some church clothes to do it. I looked the part. I looked the part. I looked the part. God help us. Because that is, you know, the devil have us fool, have us trick. We are so, you know, and we, and, and guess what? I hear people telling people, you know, and we, we want to tell people, keep coming, keep coming, because God's going to change your mind. You got to love, keep coming, keep coming. You're not doing a favor by, for God because you come, but you're coming for a purpose for God to do a work in your life. For God to change your mind. For you to give God the glory. Say, Lord, I'm coming because you deserve it. You deserve the glory. You deserve my praise. I'm showing up because I'm grateful that I can. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, God. We got it twisted. When people, and I, I like when, when, when uh, Brother Troy says people put, Faces on God, and they 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 look at God as a person, as somebody sitting next to them on the pew, and not as the glorious King, not as the Savior, not as the one that holds my breath. Hallelujah! I have gratitude. He's the one when I need help, when I need someone, when I need Him. He's the one that comes down and heal my body. He is the one that comes down and give me strength. He is the one that touched me. He is the one that died so that I can be free, so that I can reign with him, so that I can have a relationship with him. But when I put a face on him, that church hurt my feelings. And I put the church's face on God and say, well, I'm done with God. Oh, God, you should be glad that I'm still walking in the dove because the church hurt me. Ooh, we have to get a grip on this. The, they, the, they don't exist. The church don't exist. For us, we exist to serve God. We exist to worship him. That is what our existence is supposed to consist of, worship. Worshiping our king of kings. Worshiping Jesus. Because I'm learning, I don't want to just say worshiping God. Mm. We worship the one true God whose name is Jesus. It say Paul clearly articulated that people will be servants of something. And that's the essence of our being. And when, when, when we learn about worship and we go back and we learn uh, uh, how our creation and how we are created and what we are created to do, then you get an understanding that we are created to worship. So therefore, worship is part of our being. Worship is part of our DNA. Okay? We can't get around worship. Now, here it says, either servants of sin leading to physical and spiritual death, you're going to worship something. That's what this section is trying to let you know. Because you're created to do it, you're going to automatically do it. The key is where you're going to place the worship. Who are you going to worship? What are you going to worship? It say either you're going to be servants of sin leading to physical and spiritual death or slaves to righteousness leading to holiness and everlasting life. You are going to make a choice on what you and who you worship. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the key you like about Esther was the key in that whole thing. Even though he was able to get her down. Mm -hmm. But that's not what she wanted. I don't want what I did. I have a purpose. 
Mm. All right, all right. Yes, yes, yes. And that's momentary. Mm -hmm. But when you go for intangible, peace, joy, love, those are inner man things that can't nobody touch. Mm. That's it, that's it. All right, all right, yes. I got, I'm so mad at what happened, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta dash it out on somebody. So I need a tangible thing. Hmm. So why not the church? Mm hmm. Because what I was seeking for intangibly, they hurt me, but that's because it was when you went there, you offered an a tangible thing in place of. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. The hand of God is already going to provide. That's his character. All right, all right. Yes, it is. But when you see the face, that's sacrifice. That's something that people can't see. Don't nobody know every sacrifice you eat. It needs to in here, man, to get here. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody understand the sacrifice each one of us make just to make it through the week. All right, all right. Just to make sure we fast and pray and stand in faith God. Those are sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But when I show you, like the Pharisee, a little white, I'm hanging out, but I'm letting you hear my stomach growl. Tangible, because I want you to believe this. But here, Esther, when they looked at her demeanor and her character, that stood out because it was nothing about that intangible, nothing about that tangible. <laughs> the beauty she had. Praise God. Thank you for that evangelist. And, and looking back at that part, she's speaking. It said, but true joy, peace, and contentment are found when God's people embrace the truth that we are his servants. That's intangible. That's in, internal. That's eternal. Praise God. Yes, evangelist. Mm-hmm. Yes. You don't just get it. It ain't just gonna fall on your lap. And he does sexual stuff. 
Mm -hmm. on us. But it is our job to do the homework. Mm -hmm. It's our job to make the effort of giving it what God. And, and she was selected out of, she was selected to love, you know, a favorite more than, mm -hmm. which is the type of ecclesia. We are called out from among Mom. them. All right. You know, I'm just saying. They you know, he's separate. Uh, you know, why? Because he's looking for something. Mm -hmm. he, he's looking for something today. You know, give him what he likes. And if you don't say nothing, that was in that, that other verse. Mm -hmm. Just because you got a seat, don't mean you won't be healed to that seat. Mm -hmm. So speak up because mm -hmm. it ain't about your seat, Esther, because when they find out you were Jew, you, you go see. down with us. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you ain't saying to yourself about Mm -hmm. You will be hurt too when they find out who you really are because they, her name was Odessa. Okay? They gave her that stuff. All right? Uh -huh. But they won't do the DNA fine. You are too. <laughs> Guess what? Saying nothing, you go down too. Mm -hmm. and that, that was her choice, and, and, and that's what we were talking about. There, there's a, you, you got those challenging choices. Mm -hmm. Don't or do. And so we going we going a little bit further. Say Esther chose, and see here, here we go with that choice. You, when you were just talking, evangelist, but she chose to serve God by. Yeah. And and this is the key that I I saw. Um, and you know the writer brought out that the prophets were silent at that at that point in time. They you know in this in this uh, portion. Uh, here it say Esther chose to serve God. Now we look at that and say, okay, she chose to serve God. That's not, but let, this is going to tell you how she chose to serve God. By, by is the key word. She, Esther chose to serve God by obeying her uncle Mordecai and submitting to the king's rule. She could have submitted to the king's rule and not obey Mordecai. Yes, she could obey Mordecai and forgot protocol. But oh, she chose to serve God by obeying her uncle Mordecai and submitting. Remember I said there was an active listener on the scene. Yes. So in order to serve God, she had to get with who was listening to God. Who's getting instructions. So therefore, here come uncle. Okay, I got to give you some instructions. This is what's going on. And we're going to get there uh, 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 in a minute. But the key word in that statement is by obeying her uncle. By obeying the voice of the one that has the ear to God. God lends it to them. They speak it. Thus says the Lord. They give you what God is saying. And based on how you respond to that. Says if you're choosing to serve God. There was, there was a criteria. There was something going on here. You, anybody can just stand up and say, I choose to serve God and just as disobedient. The actions dictate who you serve. The actions dictate your choice. What your choice happened to be. You ain't got to yell out your choice. You ain't got to stand up with a flag and say what my choices are. Your actions are going to tell everybody what your choices are. Glory to God, because when obedience is nowhere in the picture, we don't have to have a dictionary or anything to describe who you, what you decided to choose. It said, we too are blessed when we obey godly elders and godly authority. See, some, see, see I like that when he put the and, godly elders and godly authority. Because sometimes the person is not an elder. It's people, you know, who play with titles and, and different things like that. So not necessarily just the elder. But if it's a godly authority, 
because God will give a, a, a spiritual authority to someone for you to uh, 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 glean from. Or God will use someone with spiritual authority to give you some instructions or tell you or give you a, a way out or, or, or just open, uh, enlighten you on something. And they may not have a title. But at that time, it's a godly authority. And what do you choose to do with that? Look and say, I've been saved longer than you. How dare you try to talk to me? Here we go again. You should be glad that I'm even listening to you. You should be glad I didn't tell you to shut up. Spiritual authority. It says when we obey godly elders and godly authority, people today don't want to be submitted to godly authority. They don't want to be submitted <clears throat> to to uh, uh, have someone have the rule over you and speak into your life and, and guide you. But in this lesson today, we see that when she submitted and obeyed to her uncle, she submitted to guidance. She didn't know what was going on, but God, somebody had an ear. It says here, many in today's culture do not want to hear lessons about obedience and submission. And we just talked about that. It may be that obedience and submission to godly authority are two of the most countercultural topics in the world today. But both are still biblical principles. And that's the whole key. When we neglect biblical principles, we do not get biblical blessings. We will not uh, uh, inherit what God wants for our lives because we're not applying the biblical principles. Obedience is a biblical principle. It says here, God called his followers to obey his word and submit to its authority. And, and, and it gives a clear uh, um, ex explanation of submission. Submission is not blind obedience devoid of thought or emotion. And that's what a lot of people think, that submission, you're supposed to submit, 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 and you're supposed to just walk behind somebody and say, okay, whatever they tell me to do, okay, whatever they tell me to do, okay, I'll do, I'll do like you don't have a brain, you don't have no emotions, you don't have no thought process. That's not submission. That's not what we're talking about. It says submission is obeying God's word when the natural man does not want to obey. Submission is following God in his word, even when the outcome does not seem clear from a human perspective. And they said human perspective nicely. We're talking about carnality. Submission is obeying God's word, even when the world around us throws off all restraint. And I like when evangelists were saying Esther was, was, was separated. Favor was on her, so she stood out. That's why God wants us to choose him. When we choose him, we stand out from among the crowd. When we choose to walk in his light, when we choose to allow his light to shine through us, we stand out. When he say, uh, 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 separate yourself, come out from among them because he wants us separated. Yes. Mm such a time 
And you you just uh, reiterated the point when we said when she chose to serve God by obeying her uncle and submitting to the king's rule. So when, and I, I was listening to you when you say Bastion didn't come when the king called, she chose not to come. And we're not put him in the godly state, right, right. but because of the king's rule. Yeah. Now we we here, and he, we going back to when we forget that we are here for God's use and for God's purpose. And when the king calls, when the king say go, when the king say stand, when the king say do this, when the king say say that, and we don't heed the call, right. we missed it. So we missed our for such a time. We may not end up in the place we are supposed to be in for the time. Because we are not heeding the king's call. We are missing it. It said, now we're going into Haman's plot and we're going to move fairly quickly. Mordecai refused to bow. And, and we, 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 we understand that. We, we just got these, these in these past couple of Sundays, we just getting this don't bow message. Don't bow message. Because we just talked about Daniel who wouldn't bow. The three Hebrew boys that wouldn't bow. And all of these are running neck and neck with each other. And it says Haman's plot to kill the Jews started with, it said it began as anger toward one man. Be mindful when you hate somebody that much. When you start hating one person and then that person is not going down fast enough for you. They're not miserable enough for you. Then therefore, then you start hating his family. You start hating a friend that like him. Anybody attached to him, you just hate him because the hate festered and it grew. Yes. Yes. He didn't like Mordecai. He was mad at Mordecai. So uh, it makes people mad when you don't bow. It, it, some people can't stand it when you don't give in to their foolishness. Yes. Some people can't stand it if you say, well, I don't want to indulge in that. Oh, you, you too holy, or you too this, and you too that. And just because you deny them, they hate you. And because now, you in their mind, now you're being too holy. You're holier than that. Now I got to take you down. Now when you have influence over with that one, oh, really? I'm hating you enough to I'm going to kill that one. Because you got influence on them. So if I kill that one, that's going to hurt you. Because I'm trying to strike you. So I'm going to strike everything around you because you're not hurting bad enough. Mm. But this lesson should be a reminder that that don't work. It didn't work for Haman and it won't work for you. So if it didn't work for him, why do you try to do the same thing? You may not be building a, 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 a gallow. You may not be doing that. But in the spirit realm, you're building gallows. You're setting plots. You're setting traps. And if it didn't work here, why are you trying to do it? It's not going to work. God is the same yesterday. Today and forever, the word of God is for our learning. And we should be learning that if it didn't work then, it's not going to work now. Basic lesson. It says here, Mordecai refused to bow before Haman. He don't, it, 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 it said, however, he was not alone being a Jewish man who refused to bow. And so it goes back and it talks about the, the Hebrew boys and Daniel and all that. And it says, even as captives, many Jews held fast to their faith in God and refused to bow and worship toward any other. Okay. A Mordecai, what happened here, uh, 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 through cap, though captive and without any 
uh, many resources to help him till Mordecai still refused to pay homage to Haman. See, that's the whole problem. Haman had a pride issue. See, pride, pride gets the best of people. See, see, and when I say saying yesterday, today, and forever, pride is one of those things that haven't changed. It's still there. It still infiltrates. It still tries it. And if you can recognize pride now, we need to fast, do some more fasting and some more praying so we recognize pride when his head stands up. So here, there we are in a pride situation. And we always talk about how pride, pride don't stay little. Pride always, it, it connects all of the other lusts and all, everything is in with pride. Pride is like the seed of, of, of what was that? The, a cancer. Pride is a, is a cancer. It's a seed and it starts sprouting all these things. So when Mordecai didn't want to bow to Haman, now Haman mad because you don't want to pay homage to me. I don't like you. And because it didn't phase Mordecai if he liked him or not. That don't bother me because you don't like me. And because it didn't face him. Well, I don't like all your people either. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get him. Trying to get him. Something going to make you mad. Yes. We go over here that Haman was offended. He was offended. Uh -huh. See, that's what we're trying to. We don't care if you're offended. That's it. He was I offended. Never that's it. Offenses will come. Will come. <laughs> All right. Was offended. Was offended. It comes back. It don't mean it up when you should. But you will be offended when I choose God rather than you. Right. So get over it. Get over it. Don't, you, I, and I implore you to get over it. <laughs> Because then it starts growing and festering and turning into something else. It says, it, it says, uh, uh, Mordecai remained faithful to God and his faithfulness led him right into the center of attention. <laughs> so now he's the center of attention against the one with all the pride. Oh, God, this man is on my nerve. Haman sought to destroy the Jews. Oh, man. And then now, Evangelist, you just brought up his, his lineage, and, 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 and not necessarily lineage, but where he stemmed from. Okay, and that's in our next section, Session, and I won't linger on that because we, we're going to be coming to the end. Haman was an ag, agagite. Okay, and, it's, and I'm going to read this portion because it gives the, the little history of the Haman. Biblical scholars believe this reference to Haman's ancestry points to the king Agai, Agag of the Amalekites described in 1 Samuel 15 and 20. And so it seems the author of Esther is connected Haman to the wicked king of the Amalekites and to that same tribe that had for so long attempted to destroy God's people. Okay? Consider Haman's response when learning Mordecai was a Jew instead of attempt in, in, when Mordecai was a Jew. Instead of attempting to kill him, Haman began to plot to destroy all of God's people. It's like he was just so oh, engulfed. He took his hatred out on everybody. It's like, be mad at that one. But now you're going to be mad at me because we are the same. It said, in the enduring hatred of Amalek, whom Saul refused to destroy. See, it goes all the way back here. Oh, my God. When you refuse to destroy what God said destroy. When you refuse to get rid of what God say get rid of. When you try to save something. When you try to bury something. When you try to embrace some things that God say let go of. Right, I will try. 
God. Mm. Pride, the things that you you may like, you know. Well, I I, I like to 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 look at this, or I like to I want to hang on to that, and God say, get rid of it because it's attached to something. All right, all right. And I can't fully engulf you. I can't fully embrace you unless you let it go. And we want to hold on to it because that's our safety net. And a lot of times it's because that's our comfort zone. See, see, the, our problem is we like to comfort zones. Yeah. We like our boxes. We like our boxes. We can be squished. God is trying to move us out. We didn't, we didn't, we ain't got no more room in the box. All right. But we didn't got used to the box. So we want to stay in the box. And God is saying, let the box go. I done already looked at y'all. Y'all done read the, the story of the, the cheese, you know, yeah, we move my cheese, cheese, move the cheese. And then when the top is, the lid is off. And now you can just stand up and come on out and be free. But you want to hang on to your box. You want to keep going in that circle because that's what you're used to. God, meet me in this part. I'm going to run around and meet me in the front, God. I'm going to run around and meet me in the back God. When God said, come out of it, I'll meet you when you come out. I'll meet you on the other side of it. But you're trying to tell God to meet me here. I'm, I'm, and then, then God, then you snatch me out. And God said, I took the lid off. You walk out. And I'm going to meet you when you walk out. I'm going to be there when you walk out. When you're trying to hold on to stuff, it will be you. I saw it, damn. And that's why, that's why Yes. Yes. All right, all right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, sometimes it's literal. Uh huh. Right, right. Right. In the past. Got to get rid of the fear. I love it. Mm -hmm. mm, that's it. And, and you're so right. Those, those things, those strongholds. They're strongholds. And, and sometimes a stronghold, God can release a stronghold when you just obey and walk out. Because sometimes just the simple thing of God says, stand up and say, God loves you. And our fear overtakes us that people are gonna look at me. Here we go with the fear of people to when if we just immediately 
obey the king when he say do something and you just stand up and do it, he can erase all that fear in the moment. Because he's instantaneous. He can do a suddenly on you when you do a sudden obey. Oh, when you do a sudden obey, he can do a suddenly in your spirit. Glory to God. But he said, when you refuse to destroy what I command you to, then guess what? In this lesson, the display of it came in the actions of Haman. It went down through and, and showed up through Haman. We got to be careful that our actions and the things we refuse to do with God is affecting somebody. So for such a time as this, we got to obey God because we don't know what this such a time is and who it's for. We don't know. But if we don't apply the biblical principles of obedience to, to our ordered steps, if we don't walk our ordered steps, we may miss that crucial time. It says here, it said God chosen people have been punished by God. Now look at this, and I'm, I'm going to be in the soon. God's chosen people have been punished by God, okay? <laughs> Carried away as captives. We got a list here, okay? They were weakened. They were no longer a nation. And they were suffering the consequences of their sin. Now, don't you think they were paying enough? They were already punished. But it wasn't good enough for Haman. It said, but that was not enough for their enemy. He still sought their total destruction. Now, he's sitting here. They all captive. They all weakened. They died a nation. Not, 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 not. But because he mad at Mordecai. Because he mad at that one person, I'm going to destroy all the people that's already suffering. Now, that makes you a man. You going to destroy the weak people. <laughs> you going after the weak people. They already suffering. So now I'm going to attack the weak people because they ain't bowing to me. You going to bow to me. Now, you mad at the weak people because the weak people not bowing. You all tough. I'm going to destroy you. They were already being kind of destroyed in their circumstances. They brought it on themselves, but they were still in the situation. So you're just going to pile it on because you really want Mordecai to feel it. And he don't show that he's feeling it enough. People who live for God are called by his name are still Targets of the adversary. Ah. Yeah, the big, now, target, you know. We know the store target, but you know, you know the symbol of target. The store is this bullseye, right? The bullseye. Just look in your back and see if you got a bullseye on your back. You know. Drink some water and see if you if you're leaking for the darts that's on you that's in your bullseye. People who live for God and are called by His name are still targets of the adversary. The adversary is not content. <laughs> is he ever content? Do the adversary get content? I, I don't think there is a contentment because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And once he does that, he moves to the next person because he's not content. I need more. I need more. I need more. It's an addiction. I need more. I need more. So he's not going to stop at you. He's going to go to the next person. It said the adversary is not content to see people suffer from bad choices and simple decisions. He wants their total destruction. Now, that's what we're trying to tell people. The adversary will get you on that limb. And you standing out there like, Lord, how did I get here? But then he's going to take his boot and try to kick you off of it. Kick you off the limb. Because he's not satisfied that you're already in a place where you're all these bad choices 
got you out here by yourself, got you separated from your God, got you, got you now, you know, some are addicted, some are doing this, something dabbled, something done this. Now you got all this unforgiveness. Now you got all of this baggage that you brought on yourself because of bad choices. But guess what? The adversary, he's still not done. He don't, it don't bother him that you sitting here condemned. It don't bother you that, it don't bother him that you sitting here can't get into the service, can't get into the praise, can't get into the worship. It don't bother him about that. He's still ready to kick you off the cliff because you're not destroyed yet. Because as long as you got your breath, as long as you got your mind, you can do it suddenly. God can come and you can just lift your hands and say, God, forgive me. And God can bring you out of it right away. And he don't want that. He's trying to avoid that. He's trying to keep you in a place where you don't realize that. So he wants your total destruction. The enemy wants our worship. That was Haman. He wanted to worship. He wanted Mordecai to pay homage to him. It's, it, you know, pride is a big thing. That thing, that pride can just engulf a person. And it engulfed him. It says here, and I'm skipping down, the enemy seeks worship. Okay? Often he will settle for God's people not giving God the worship he deserves, but the enemy's ultimate aim is to receive allegiance to himself. He wants total, he wants total allegiance. But then guess what? He still is not one that once you give him total allegiance, he's going to cover you and protect you. He now going to still destroy you. After you didn't submit it all to him, he's going to destroy you. God's people must be like Mordecai, whether surrounded by support and strength or on your own in a foreign place. They must take a stand and worship only the one true God. The book of Esther is about God's people being delivered from their enemies. You can be encouraged to know that your worship matters to God. Worship matters to God. Who you pay homage to matters to God. Who you give your allegiance to matters to God. It says here, we may seem insignificant and at times we may feel small, but every individual worship is paramount in the kingdom of God. Oh my God. What, what is that, that about the, the least in the kingdom? I mean, the least, who you think is the least is the greatest. You understand what I'm saying? The, the, you can't, you don't have God's mind. He, 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 the small, he makes that the one that's greater because our, our mind will now get caught up with who's greater, who's more educated, who's more powerful, who has the biggest army. And then what did he tell who was that Gideon? He said, cut it down, cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. We're going to cut it down to a place where I get the glory. So where are you looking at this person as nothing? I'm getting the glory out of their life. Every time we worship God, the enemy is defeated. Every time we give God the glory, the enemy is defeated. Every time we're in a bad situation and we still look up and say, but God, you get my glory. God, I trust you in it. And I'm waiting for you to bring me through it. And you still get the glory. The battle the Jews will fight and win years later was begun by one man who refused to bow. They could have been destroyed, but because he refused to bow, his first act of defiance set the tone and was critical in their subsequent victory. For such a time, you are setting the tone for something. For something. It says, one day, and it gives this other analogy talking about the beggar and how this beggar kept, you know, he was a beggar and somebody kept coming by and asking for his stuff. 
asked him for his rights and he was getting irritated and irritated. And so he gave it, you know, he kept giving it to him. But the more he, every day, every day, he was coming by, let me have some rice. Let me have this. And it was like, wait a minute. At the end, he's like, wait a minute. I ain't going to have nothing. You keep coming by, taking mine. I'm the beggar. But then the stranger smiled and asked the beggar if he had checked his bowl from the morning. The bowl he was pulling the rice out of. Did you check it? And it says here that pulling the bowl down, the beggar pulled the bowl down from the ledge. He peered in and was stunned by what he saw. For every grain of rice the stranger had taken in his place, he had left a diamond. When you give praise to God, you receive vastly more than what you give. You can never give more to God than he's able to give back to you. There is a song, the offering song that they used to sing, the more he gives, the more he gives to you. You know that song, just keep on giving. You can't be God giving, thank you. That's the song, you can't be God giving. By withholding praise from the one who didn't deserve it, the evil Haman Mordecai reserved his praise for the one who did deserve it. And begin coming to a close, we had Esther stand. We talked about how Mordecai set things in motion, okay? He set things a series of events. Now, everyone in their life have pivotal moments that bring you to a place. And, and a lot of people, we sit and talk about it, and you will remember, you know what? This is my pivotal moment that caused me to do this. This was a pivotal moment that caused me to turn my life around. This was a pivotal moment that caused my thinking to change. She had a pivotal moment. Esther was faced with the decision of a lifetime. Mordecai knew of the decree and began wandering the city with sackcloth and ashes. He's mourning because of what will befall God's people, okay? And so then it says, the Bible says Esther sent clothes to Mordecai, okay, for him to wear and take his sackcloth away from him. Because that's her uncle. She didn't want him walking around like that. So she's going to send clothes to him. But he wouldn't accept it. Uh-uh. No. Uh-uh. There, I, I got a purpose. There's something going on. No. I, I, I got to go. I'm, I'm in, con I'm in con consecration because I got to hear from God. Remember, I said there was an active listener in the place. There was an active listener among them. So now he's in South Park. Actually, he need to know. He got to figure out what to do with this. I know something that's going to destroy us. It says here, this small bit of information sheds light on the words of Mordecai to Esther only a short time later in the chapter. It is not overly speculative to suggest that Esther was perhaps hoping to avoid creating a scene. She was safe in the king's house. She was the queen. Perhaps she believed she could be secure. She could secure the salvation of her family as well, including Mordecai, because she was there. I'm in a place and he loves me. So maybe because he loved me enough, he, he loved me enough to just spare the people. But Mordecai challenged any notion of self-preservation that would be gained by not taking a stand. And we know we come to the place where he told Esther his message. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the, the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, remember for such a time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But yeah, they're gonna come again. It, it's not gonna stop. If you hold your peace, it's not gonna stop. It says, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? All of this you have been given, all this favor have you given. Do you think, think in your mind that maybe you were just set up for this? Did you ever think you're set up for this moment? Ah, oh, God. Hallelujah. When someone sitting next to you and God said, give them a word, do you think you were set up for that moment? When the time to say God loves you and you can make it, do you think you were set up? Glory to God. Mordecai delivered the message that her position is not going to save her and her family. Being silent and here with, with Brother Troberson and fearful while hiding and hoping for the best was not the solution for this challenge. 
okay? Her life hung in the balance as well as everybody else's. Now we're going to a request of the king, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving me a couple of more minutes and we'll be done. Esther heeded the words. Remember the, in the earlier, it said she obeyed, okay? She heeded the words and prepared for battle through prayer and fasting. See, there's a preparation. Wow. <laughs> When you know that you need God in a certain way, when you know that there's spiritual warfare, when you want something from God, you there is there when you you understand I got to prepare for this battle. I got to prepare for what I want from God. I got to prepare. And then it say only after praying did she approach the king. She didn't jump ahead, she prepared. Glory to God, her prayers and fasting strengthened her. It, it said it, it likely strengthened her resolve. You got to understand prayer and fasting, it changes you. It don't move God faster, it is for you. It is for your preparation. It is for you to prepare and, and causes you to bring everything into alignment. It causes you to submit. It causes everything to go into one accord. Hallelujah. So that it's available. It's free from things. It's free from anything that's going to hinder the work. But it's free in you. And God is waiting for you to be free to complete the assignment. So prayer and fasting brings everything about you under submission. That's what it does. And it's called the preparation for the battle. Oh God, we got to prepare saints of God. Things are coming. Things are going on right now among us. Hallelujah. We got to be prepared. We got to be prepared for the influx that God is going to send in. We got to be prepared. Ah, glory to God. We can't neglect preparation. Oh, God. Before she even became queen, she had to prepare. That's what made her stand out. Hallelujah. Because of the preparation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When he says separate yourself and come out from among them, guess how you able to do it? Because of the preparation. Flesh don't want to move. But we got to bring flesh into submission. Glory to God. And then it said here, she did not reveal her request. And we understand the first meal. She didn't reveal it because what preparation caused her to have an ear and be guided. She, she was able to be movable and instructed. Mm, a strategy, strategy, the call strategy to come. Glory to God. She didn't reveal during the first meal. She, she got them to say, hmm, interesting. I'm, I'm interested. Instead, she invited the king and Haman to another banquet the following day. Ha. We shouldn't get upset with God's delays because he just may have a plan. He just may have a plan. Okay? In this, there may be just a plan because of the delay. Okay, I can't reveal the plan in the first meal. Okay, so overnight the king couldn't rest. And so we understand that portion that the king couldn't rest. So he got up and was reading the records and I'm going to move through. Okay, but, but what happened because he started reading the records, now he's reading this story about a man who uncovered an assassination plot and was never rewarded. So what did he do? Oh, I'm going to go to the pride man mm. and get suggestions. Mm, what you think we should do? How you think we should handle this? You know, you appeal to that pride. Okay, that's his job. Reverence me. Talk to me. Bring it to me. So guess what? God used that. What you think we should do, big man? How we handle that? Don't know he's being set up. That I will say. Hallelujah. And so then, what did he say? He ain't been given y'all do for deserving of honor. So guess what? Then next thing you know, the man he hated. 
Ah! Mordecai was then honored by the king for his service. The honor was conveyed on him by Haman. Now you to honor, because you can't let the king know how much you hate him. So you got to play the game. And he's like, green his teeth. Congratulations. Here's your trophy. Thank you for your service. <laughs> that was hard work. You know, that is the worst thing you can do to a person that's hating you. Is to go up into their face and they got to smile and shake your hand. They got to be the one to give you the gifts. Oh my God. Heaping coals up. Now you know that just really dug into what he was already mad about. And then see, then the king returned for the banquet. Now he coming to the, the eat again. The second time. Because the plan is already in motion. And then now he's sitting there talking. They all full. This was good. Hey, she fed me. We good. And then the king and Haman returned for the evening banquet with queen, where she told the king of the danger to herself and her people. The king was outraged and ordered Haman to be hung. Now she let the ball, she, she, she let it out. Esther's bold steps of faith were rewarded by God. And then we all know that Haman, the gallows that he built, he was hung on them. And then Mordecai was exalted. When God exalts you, can't nobody bring you down. You don't know what God is going to do when you step into your such a time. When you walk your such a time, yes, yes. when you walk in obedience to get to your such a time, you being set up, glory to God, you being set up for greatness. Obedience sets you up for greatness. Worship to God sets you up for greatness. It sets you up for higher heights and deeper depths in God. It says we have been called to work the kingdom for such a time as this. Because she found herself in the kingdom at the right time. We are in this place at the right time. You all, everyone here, have something to present God. We have an assignment from God. It is the right time. You're in the right place at the right time to get some right instructions. Hallelujah. So that you can do the right thing. Hallelujah, we're not going to be out of time because our good intentions are not going to work. It got to be at the right time, in the right place. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It says here, certainly what God has done in the past is exciting. And what God plans to do in the future is wonderful. But what, but we are only given the present. And what are we doing with the present? We only have the present. When if God lets us see tomorrow, it's going to be the present. What are you doing with the present? Be blessed in Jesus' name. Uh, um, service will begin and shortly join us. Praise God. We turn the service back into the hands of the pastor. Oh, Thank you, God. Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, praise God. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. Praise. Glory to God. Beautiful lesson, beautiful lesson. Um, Talk about Lady P, for such a time, glory to God. And so, and, and, and you see that, you know, for us, Esther, you know, for such a time as this, and that's thing is, Lord knows, you like the Lady B has said, we are, there's no, it's not my mistake why we're here. Not my mistake, for such a time as this, glory to God, my God. My God, so we thank God for that beautiful lesson. We get ready to dismiss. Uh, we just thank God for all that He has said. I thank God for the comments I heard. Glory to God. So much. This is what Sunday school is all about. You come and you get, you're able to, you learn and you get an understanding, and it helps us to continue to grow. Glory to God. So a beautiful lesson for us. Glory to God. If nothing else, we're going to stand and be dismissed. Maybe we'll come on right back. And, 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 uh,